Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So thankful for who you are and all you've done in our lives, for the opportunity you've given us to just come and feast together on your word. I just ask you to filter out all of that which is not true, all of that was that which is foolish and ignorant, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, the truth that you'd have us know. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We are studying together in 1 Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we got approximately down to verse 20 of chapter 15. I want to thank you all for your continued interest in these studies. Verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. The first fruits. The Lord made it very clear that there are two resurrections. Uh, marvel not at this, he says in John chapter 5, for the hour is coming when all who are in the grave shall hear his voice. They that have done good to the resurrection of life. That's the first resurrection. And they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. That's the second resurrection. Um, so there are two resurrections. By man came death. It's Adam. By man, Adam came death. So by man comes a resurrection of the dead. Now that man has to be Jesus Christ. And I've stressed in in study after study after study that if Christ did not come in the flesh, we are not redeemed. God Almighty became incarnate. He came in flesh. He was our kinsman redeemer. The only way uh, the death that, that came by man could be satisfied was by man. Therefore, there's a a dominance of, of man and kingdom in the Word of God. You know, God said, let us make man in our own image. You know, and as we look at each other, you know, we, we think, well, you know, God, God must have made a few mis mistakes, but, but come on, dearly beloved, we are created in the image of God. In in Genesis chapter 1, God said, Be fruitful, uh, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and, and have dominion over, over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing. You know, uh, that's what we read in Genesis. That is man's domination. God gave man dominion over the entire earth, and he gave man dominion over every living thing on that earth. And then, of course, you know, well, Satan has to, you know, interfere because he's God's enemy. And man fell. So by man came death, and God then came around and set up the kingdom in Israel. And he says in 1 Kings 2, 1 Kings 2, And King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. He's speaking to David, but he's, he's talking about Solomon when he's talking to David. I'll set up his kingdom for Israel forever, as I promised to David, thy father, saying, There shall not fail to be a man upon the throne of Israel. Now, 
Then in 1 Chronicles 17, 1 Chronicles 17, but I will settle him in mine house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forevermore. And the problem with that is that in Jeremiah chapter 22, Jeconiah is cursed, and Jeremiah 22 says that no man of the seed of Jeconiah will ever sit on the throne of David, ruling over Judah. You know, that's quite a condemnation on the kingly line because Jeconiah is of the seed of Solomon and his kingdom. Um, Jeconiah is in the kingly line. He's a descendant of Solomon. So no descendant of Solomon can reign on the throne. But God had said that I will settle Solomon in my house and in my kingdom forever. Forever. His throne shall be established forever. And Satan must have, well, he must have really gloated, you know, when he messed up, you know, Jack and I's life because, well, you know, now no, no, no descendant of Solomon can reign on the throne. Of course, we always, you know, we've all, we always see how, you know, he's outsmarted. Uh, God's always one move ahead of him. And so if we get down through the descendants, which are carefully cataloged by God, we come to Joseph. And, you know, Joseph fell in love with a girl named Mary, and Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit and begat a son. And in Luke chapter 2, Joseph adopted him. You know, according to law, he was the son of Joseph. So, Jesus Christ is a kingly descendant of Solomon. And Jesus, despite what many would suggest, uh, Jesus didn't have any kids. So the last person, the last human entitled to the throne of Israel is Jesus Christ, God incarnate, God Almighty. And so the Jews should be very careful who they declare king because it will be Jesus Christ. And, and so we read of the Lord Jesus Christ, He shall reign and judge among the nations. He shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. <coughs> now don't ever try to suggest that there's ever been a time in human history when that's true. Uh, so we look forward to a kingdom over which Christ rules, and of that kingdom there shall be no end. You know, think of a world with peace. You know, uh, we wouldn't have a, a, a budget problem in, in this country if we didn't have a military budget. Israel's military budget's over 50% of their gross income. You know, try and imagine if you, if you can, you know, what the world would be like without a military budget. Now, I understand there'd be a lot of people out of work who make bombs and, you know, weapons and s such, but, but it'd be unbelievable. Unbelievable what we could do with the funds that we spend to fight each other. They'll learn war no more. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. Total peace. Absolute peace. There, sh there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. And it's also a world without end. The world doesn't, isn't ever going to end. Okay? It, it will be remade. It will get, be, God will give it a makeover, but it will never end. So in a very real sense, you and I, we ain't going anywhere, folks. We're not going anywhere. We're going up for a little while, but 
but we're here for the long haul. I just find that one fact alone fascinating. I will never go anywhere except maybe just up for a little while and back down. And the, the only one entitled to that throne is Christ. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid. Uh, my text says that the calf and the young lion and the little child shall lead them. The cow uh, and the bear, the cow and the bear feed. Uh, they're young, they lie down together. The lion eats straw like the ox, they'll not hurt, they'll not hurt and or destroy in all of my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Bear those scriptures in mind when people say that we're living, well, we're living in that time. Christ is, is, is not presently on the throne of David. He's at the right hand of God the Father. The kingdom age is mentioned as a thousand years in Scripture. Uh, in fact, uh, six times it's said to be a thousand years. Six times in Scripture, it's said to be a thousand years. And there are those who think that we're not, or there's, there's those who think we're in it. I do not. And there are those who, who believe that there never will be a kingdom. Now, let's, let's go back to our text. Okay, let's go back to our text. Verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Verse 23, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. And I want you to note this is first fruit singular. Everybody says first fruits. It's not. It's, it's singular. Look at it. It's not plural. Christ the first fruit is risen. Your body is going to look like Christ's. If you want to know what your risen body, you know, when you rise from the dead is going to look like, it's like Christ's. And then it says every man in his own order or, or group. Christ the first fruit, then they that are Christ's at his coming. Not those in Christ, those that are Christ's at his coming. And we can't make this coming when we accepted Christ. It just doesn't work biblically. When did he come? Well, when when you accepted Christ, uh, you know, that's that's the Arminian position. You know, you're on your way to hell and you suddenly realize that Jesus Christ died for you, you repent, you confess your sins, you make Him Lord of your life, or maybe you don't make Him Lord of your life, but, but and now you're headed for heaven. Yeah, that's when He came. That's when Christ came. The problem with that is that, is that makes heaven the result of something that you do, which I've spoken a whole lot about, which does not have any biblical support whatsoever, despite the millions that believe that. And you can argue that there's biblical support for you being saved by something that you do. And there are such texts, but there are no texts which suggest that you go to heaven by something you do. None. You go to heaven because Jesus Christ died in your place. You've always been His. You were Christ's before He created the heavens and the earth. And uh, that's where the Arminian loses sight of biblical truth. You are His because He, and only because He chose you. He paid for your sin debt. The sin debt is paid. You're going to heaven because he died in your place. It's that simple. Okay? Now, if you, if you accept that, and you receive that, and you believe that, that is phenomenally wonderful. I mean, that's, that's awesome. That's great. Okay? Wonderful to know that, but knowing it doesn't make it true. It is true. Christ, the first fruit. 
afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Not those in Christ, but th that are Christ's. It includes more than those just in Christ. Hasn't come yet. You can't, you can't make his coming when you accepted Christ. He's coming again. He has a reward for those who look for his appearing. He has a reward for those who love his appearing. Strange how we often get so criticized for that, but we are told over and over again to watch for his coming. So we're in very simple language looking at some very profound truths concerning all of this, but, you know, uh, uh, pre-trib, okay? If you believe, if folks, if you believe Christ could come today, then you're a pre-tribulation uh, dispensationalist. If, if you do not believe that, then you're not looking for His coming. You know, He couldn't come today. Because, you know, you haven't seen the Antichrist. Uh, you haven't seen... Uh, the tribulation that's greater than any tribulation that, that there ever was or ever will be. You haven't seen uh, people being put to death and beheaded for the, te the testimony of Christ on a m massive scale. You haven't seen that, so He can't come yet. You might as well just sit back and wait, which is exactly what the Christian religious establishment in the main is doing today. But, if you believe that He could come tonight, if you believe that He could come tomorrow during the day, if you believe that He can come at any time, if you believe in the, in the rapture of the church, there will be a time when He comes in the clouds to receive you unto Himself, and after that there will be the Antichrist, the man of sin, the period of, of the Great Tribulation, and, and, and so on and so forth, and, and all the way through to Christ returning with us, His saints, and the armies which are in heaven to rule and reign in righteousness for a thousand years. My text is showing me that I have two thens, the word then here, that are significant to me. There is first a period of time, uh, then, then they that are Christ's, that's, that's at His coming. That sounds like 1 Thessalonians 4 to me. Then another period of time, which I'm going to say, I'm going to say is a thousand and seven years. The thousand year kingdom's end, and then comes the end when He shall have delivered up the kingdom to the Father. Uh, When he shall have put all rule and all authority and, and all power uh, down, when he's put down all of that, when he's defeated his enemies, he's subdued everything, uh, when he's delivered up the kingdom to God the Father, well, when's he going to do that? Well, when he's put down all rule and authority. When he subdued all power and rule and authority. So we can't avoid the fact that we're in a prophetic passage of Scripture that there's, uh, there's going to be Christ's resurrection from the dead already done. Okay? Christ, the first fruit, singular. And then they that are Christ's at his coming. You know, we're going to be just like Him, uh, raised because we were in fact raised with Him when He was raised from the dead. The most interesting fact that you hardly ever hear Christians talk about, because He's the first fruit. That one hasn't happened yet. I know it hadn't happened yet because I'm still here. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. I do, I do believe it'll happen soon. One way or another. I And folks, I fully expect that in the end, when all of this is said and done, the history of the church will reveal that even those who are awake 
even even those who were who truly loved his appearing were so involved in biblical prophecy that they neglected sound biblical doctrine and I, I think that's a foolish mistake that we all sometimes make I just thank God that our capacity throughout eternity to manifest God's glory will be determined solely by how much we trusted Him in this life. Heaven is assured. We don't, we don't need doubt that. But whether we do or we don't, our, our glasses, if you want to look at it, is, will be both be full to the brim large glass little glass you know only some will have a greater capacity than others uh, don't don't be a little tiny glass don't be a shot glass dearly beloved you were born crucified you died to sin self the law the world satan and death six things six things you died to before you ever drew your first breath that didn't happen when you decided it would Dearly beloved, don't add any requirement to become born again unless you want to persecute the church of God like Paul did. Make no mistake about it. I have zero doubt that we are in the season of Christ's return and that the church as a whole is asleep. And awakened watchmen should be considered beneficial to the body. But in the meantime, I think we should want what God wants. He wants us to be faithful to the Word. And I want all those who love His appearing, especially those who agree that we're surrounded by apostasy, to actually know and believe the true gospel before our Lord returns and they see Him face to face. And I maintain nothing, nothing is as important as rescuing through doctrine those for whom Christ died, delivering them from the man-made bondage to the freedom that they, they actually have in Christ that they truly truly have and that they should enjoy who died in their place, whose resurrection from the dead was confirmation that what He did was sufficient. O Timothy, take heed unto thyself first, okay? And unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. I think we're put here to save one another. My text says, Christ at His coming for those who are, who are His, they that are Christ's at His coming. I think that's the coming in 1 Thessalonians 4. And then after that comes the end. That's the one in, in Revelation. That's the one in Revelation, the book of Revelation. And when he's done ruling in righteousness and in justice, uh, put down all the injustice and ruled injustice, when he's put down all rule and all authority, then he's going to deliver the kingdom to God the Father. And now don't get the idea that Christ isn't God. He is, but it's Christ incarnate, Christ the man Okay, we have a man in, in heaven. We have a God-man sitting on the throne. What rose from the dead was a body of flesh and bone. And it's in glory today. It's the incarnate, resurrected Christ that delivers up the kingdom to God, to the Father, the kingdom, the kingdom of God to the Father. And that Father, our Heavenly Father, who begat us, by the way, unto this very hope. 
You know, if you as a Christian even mention the words Heavenly Father, folks, uh, you are admitting that you had nothing to do with your spiritual new birth. If you just use the word Father, if you call upon Him as your Father, you are acknowledging the fact that you had nothing to do with being born again. God our Father, who manifests Himself as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and He does that after He has put down all rule and authority. By man came death. By man has to come the resurrection of the dead. And uh, the reestablishment of that dominion that, uh, that God gave man back in Genesis. And the last enemy, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, verse 26. There's a guy named, jo a brother of ours named John Owen, lived many years ago. He wrote a book. You can get it on the internet. You can probably get a copy of it. You can download it free, I think. It's called The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. It isn't just that Christ died in our place. But by his death on the cross, he destroyed death. And because he lives, we'll live. There can't ever be any separation of any kind. We, we can't be touched by the second death. You know, we're not just alive in Christ. Death is, is rendered invalid as, as far as we're concerned. We cannot die. We cannot ever be separated from God or, or from one another. Or in, I would, I'll go as far as to say any other possession okay, that God gives us. You know, think inheritance here. Okay. Isaiah chapter 11. A few verses in chapter 11. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fattened steer will be together. And a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together. Uh, the lion will eat straw like an ox, like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And this while our home is above. I want to talk a minute about the New Jerusalem, uh, Revelation 21, 2 and, and 10. You see two descents, verse 2 and verse 10 of chapter 21. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That's the first. You go down to verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great... Notice, he carried me away in the spirit. This is another... To a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Two descents. Well, actually, it's the same descent, but both verse 2 and both... Verse 2 and verse 10 are describing the same... As, descent where the, the city descends in verse 2 you, we have a descent and in verse 10 we have a descent both are the same descent but there's a difference in the two and I and I would love it if you would uh, all of you are interested if you just look into that you'll find out something very remarkable and that is, is that uh, it's suspended over the earth during that thousand years. The nations walk in the light of it. Uh, carried away in the spirit, it was seen to descend to the earth after the, the new heavens and the new, new earth were made. Now, that's, 
That's basically it. I sort of spilled the beans for you. That's, that's basically what we're looking at. It's been a, a real challenge to, to go verse by verse through 1 Corinthians uh, for me. Uh, I don't know where we're going next. We've got uh, the rest of this chapter, chapter 15, and then, then all of 16, and I think that we're, uh, we're going to move on somewhere else. Uh, it's my hope that we won't be here, that you know the Lord will come for us, but as long as He's here, we'll continue doing uh, occupying till he comes which i believe uh, means just that it's we we occupy ourselves with the things of the lord and uh, uh, I, I just want you all to know how much i love and appreciate you all uh, for all of your support of this for your those that support this ministry faithfully uh, we couldn't do this without you we, we love you dearly we love all of you i love all of you i truly do uh, I love all of your messages, all of your comments. Uh, I don't get around to answering them all, but I, uh, those of you who email me, uh, I truly do enjoy writing you back. Um, I just, at this point, with where the, in, in looking back at where we've come since 2016, and now here we are in the fall of 2022, uh, looks like we may go into 2023. I just want everyone to to not only keep looking up, but to to understand how much He loves you. That He died in your place. That you can never die. All of those who are struggling to to find peace and rest and comfort and freedom that they have, if 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 these are things that you've never known or never enjoyed. Just know that, that God's made that entirely possible for you in Christ. He would not have you worry. He would not have you fear. He would not have you be concerned about anything, but to trust Him in all things, which I believe is what He desires the most from us. Any suggestions on where you, you might like to go after 1 Corinthians, just email me. Drop me a quick note. Let me know on Facebook or, or through, through email. Uh, it doesn't have to be verse by verse. It can be topical uh, sermons. Uh, but uh, please continue praying for the direction of this ministry. We are praying for you all constantly. I want you to know that. Uh, every request I receive. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.